Hello, and welcome to the Long Island Local Podcast, brought to you by Audio Workstations here in Bohemia, New York. Let's jump right into the conversation with a Long Island local business owner. Welcome, everyone, to the Long Island Local Podcast. We are in season two, and we are sponsored by audio workstations and media stations here in Bohemia. Today, we are lucky enough to have with us Stephanie Morgan, the Director of Business Development of the Wellbridge Addiction and Treatment and Research Center. That's right. Thank Did you I for having me. Right? You you're, got it right. You're very welcome. It's a mouthful. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for having me. You're very welcome. And I like that there's so many things in it because... Um, as we were saying uh, before the podcast, we don't often hear the word research attached to that. So That's we'll right. get to that a little bit. Um, but first, why don't you tell me uh, how you came to uh, be working with Wellbridge and maybe a little back up a little bit and tell me what you were doing just before that and yeah. how the transition happened. Yeah, and I'm happy you asked because that's part of my favorite story. So um, right before working at Wellbridge, I was actually at Brightview Senior Living. Um, they're pretty new to Long Island, but it is assisted living, dementia care, and independent living for seniors. Um, you know, it, it was the new... The new center on Long Island, however, they have about 50 going along the East Coast. Okay. And I do find myself a lot of times starting with, you know, really new brands, new businesses, and I, and I love that. I like building brands and getting things off the ground. Um, and one of the things I liked about it was it's very individualized care for these seniors. Um, everybody gets an assessment when they come in. They get the appropriate medical placement for them. Um, and everything's very individualized. And I started that role... Just, you know, in the midst of the pandemic, actually, June of 2020. Interesting time to start somewhere. Working with seniors. Yeah. So, um, you know, it was not new in the sense of I was doing admissions and marketing and sales. And that's not new, but working with that population was new. Okay. And I loved it. I loved um, getting to know the seniors. Um, actually, the dementia residents were my favorite. Um, and I learned a lot of skills working with them. However, during that time period as we all know, what they were going through was very difficult to take part in every day because I got to go home at the end of each day and see my kids and mm -hmm. come back. And, you know, they if they really weren't able to have those freedoms. And it was very difficult. It's a big effect on visitation ability. Yes. So basically they were there under normal circumstances. They would be getting family visiting them a lot, but all of a sudden that's prohibited. Right. right. Yeah. That's extra hard. Very hard. And, you know, everybody's hands were tied. We didn't know what was going on. There's no blame to be placed at this point in time on anybody. But um, it, it can mess with your psyche a little bit when it's ongoing and they're asking you questions and the family's asking you questions. And um, at that point, I felt like I really needed to find a different focus because um, I was suffering myself mm -hmm. with my mental health. And so, you know, in that time period, I was sort of looking at what was um, available and I came across this job description for pretty much what they were looking for was community relations for uh, an addiction treatment center it was new uh, also open 2020 um, in the midst of the pandemic and at that point I said well here's a thing where I could get involved and actually help people mm -hmm. and um, what we all know what's going on with post-pandemic times if we can say post-pandemic uh, you know mental health we'll do a knock on wood for the post part knock on wood for sure um and addiction it's just skyrocketing and i thought this is funny because i actually studied social work and i studied um to be a drug counselor in my bachelor's um or my undergraduate and you know i started i was at Cortland state in my senior year and for my um internship i went into dryden which is just outside Cortland in upstate new york it's a very poverty stricken area and i was working in the elementary school with the social worker and again we were doing home visits to families that were just struggling um children under the care of really parents that probably shouldn't have had right you know care of those children um there's so much red tape and it was just again day in and day out of just very difficult situations and at that point I was young. I was naive. I I felt like, how can I go home? How can I do this as a career? I go home at the end of each day and know what they're going through and be able to sleep and come back and do it all over again. It just really felt like seeing myself doing that and as a future um, was daunting. And I sort of was dealing with um, mental health issues as well with my mother at that time. So I felt, you know what? I'm going to run away from this degree. I'm not I'm not equipped to be a therapist or a counselor or help people. 
<laughs> so um, I ended up going into hospitality and I was doing marketing and I you know, did all these different things. Um, was working in New York City at different amazing restaurants. But, you know, there's just I love that industry, but there's just a component missing. Like I know I was meant to help people. But if you're not able to step back and view mental illness and addiction as as a disease that's able to be treated, you're really not looking at it the right way and you're never going to be able to help the way you need to. So um, flash forward to when I saw this opportunity with Wellbridge, I said, I'm going to give this a shot. I'm going to go for the interview because um, this could be a good transition to getting back into that line of work where I Mm -hmm. feel like I'm more mature and capable of viewing these situations in a different light. And I had my first interview and I really loved the sound of it. I loved what they were saying their mission was, which is to help as many people suffering from addiction and the co-occurring disorders that come along with it as possible um, in a dignified and respectful way. If you could see right now the way this campus looks, I mean, it's like a spa retreat. It's incredible, wow. but it's accessible. It's, we're under all um, commercial insurances. We take you know, NYSHIP. We're working on getting Emblem Health, and those contracts are just growing. So it's not just a private pay model where only wealthy people can Right, and that's typically afford. what I think of when I think of a very nice rehab. I think that's probably something that's very expensive that only very rich people can afford. Yeah. And so if you guys are able to make that accessible to pretty much anybody under insurance, that's, a I think, a really big step forward in, yes. in that industry. A 100%. And, you know, it might have started out as that being the thought, you know, private pay, targeting demographics in New York City to come out and get this. Mm-hmm. But then they, I think, realized, well, we're not really reaching as many people. And that's when the pandemic occurred and we mm. started seeing, wow, so many people are suffering. I think everybody's yeah. touched by addiction or mental health issues. Sure. So on my second interview, um, I really knew that this was going to be the job for me because I got to sit down with the owner, Andy Drazen, who... Um, you know, didn't come from this industry either. He was a New York City businessman and in his childhood lost his mother to what he would later find out was alcoholism. Um, Him and his brother were not told that at the time. I don't know from the sound of the story that they properly were able to mourn because back then people didn't talk about mental health the way we do now. Yeah. And they later found out that that is what she passed um, from. He retired. He was... Um, volunteering time in emergency rooms and hospitals and seeing that sort of revolving door yeah. of people who were, you know, coming in for a quick detox. And of course, people are waiting and they need beds. So they're like, get these people out of here. Yeah. And that's the term. These people get them out of here. Right. And that's the stigma that we at Wellbridge are really trying to, you know, work to break down. But there's no direction. Maybe you're getting a referral to go somewhere, but who's overseeing that they are? And sure enough, they're back. The next day or two. Yeah, it's a sh- it's a short term sort of yeah. uh, based solution or treatment, and it ends up feeling maybe like a whack a mole type problem right. where the same issue pops back up again and again. Yeah, exactly, a hundred percent. So I'm sitting with Andy, and you know, I he's asking what my story is, and sometimes I we feel a little uncertain because I'm I'm not, you know, I didn't pursue my studies, I don't have any credentials the way some of my coworkers do. Um, and he's like, what's your connection to the folks that are going to be, you know, coming here and admitting here? And so I sat there and I told him the story of my own mother who, um, is diagnosed bipolar. I wasn't privy to that until, you know, being a young adult. Mm. And when she's in the throes of those manic states, she does suffer from substance abuse disorder. So, um, it's been a roller coaster with her and he was so interested in hearing my story and he said, I'm so happy you told me that. Thank you for sharing. He said, the biggest value we want to incorporate here is empathy and understanding. And so we welcome people to talk about their own personal experiences, not in the way that you're going to go to a therapy session with one of our patients and say, here's what I'm going. That's not it. But when they know that you've been there before and you've maybe walked in their shoes or their family members know you walked in their shoes, there's just this understanding and community that really is so conducive to recovery. And I was like thrown by that because my professors used to say, you don't want to talk about personal experiences. You know, you think of the movies where the psychologist is sitting there with the pencil and paper and not really even looking at the person who's laying on a couch. Like that's, that's what you would envision when you were going through school of what you could, what your career would look like. And that's not at all like what this place is. Well, that's cool. It, it definitely seems like one of those tricky lines between, okay, 
professionalism, professional boundaries, but at the same time, um, you don't want there to be this divide between like the staff and the patients. 100%. Um, because then it kind of like ends up feeling maybe more like a prisoner jail guard dynamic yeah. than it needs to. Yeah. You know what I mean? It really shouldn't feel that way because it's not that. But if, if there is this like, you know, n no relating to somebody personally, then it ends up feeling like there's this big divide. Yeah, exactly. And it could even be unspoken. You know, we have peer recovery advocates that work. One of my coworkers who covers the city, he is in recovery for about, I think it's between seven or nine years. And he is our most effective when it comes to communicating with our patients who are in crisis, who call right. us. And there's that narrow window where someone's calling and saying, I got to get somewhere. I need help right now. You know, if I could tell you what the back end of those communications look like, you know, us speaking with our support center, speaking with admissions, talking to transportation and working as fast as we can. But he is so effective at knowing the language to use with them. And, and I try to learn that every day because you don't ever want to push someone in the wrong direction. But you're also dealing with a spectrum of depending what the substance is, how they're going to, you know, are they being erratic? Mm -hmm. Are they hungover or whatever it's going to be, knowing how to speak that you're going to be most effective with them. And, and yeah. so peer recovery advocates are one of the, um, you know, I guess, licenses that we employ at Wellbridge just because they're they're so good at breaking down those barriers. Okay, got you. And, um, you know, you mentioned that you did like marketing stuff in hospitality. Mm -hmm. And um, so now like you had this path where you thought maybe you would be doing, you know, therapy counseling yourself and then backed out of it, went into marketing. But now it seems like you get to combine both of those things. Is that right? Yeah. That's kind of cool because, you know, whatever you had learned along the way while you were doing, you know, restaurants and stuff, it's kind of universally, you know, applicable to yeah. all businesses at that marketing stuff. And if they're looking to let people know what they're doing, you know, you can not only do that in a classical business sense, but you have more of a passion for it than like the average marketing person yeah. that or business development person that they might hire. Yeah. Um, and so that's cool that they are interested in, in everyone sort of being personally connected to the mission because it's yeah. going to end up making all the communications that you have about it like that much more meaningful and genuine because you actually care yeah. about what you guys are doing you I know agree. And that's, that's yeah. the best way to I'm so be happy you business. picked up on that because that's a hundred percent like that might even sound a little selfish when we're here talking about you know, a place that's helping people who are in need, but no, selfishly. but you have to love helping, though. You know yeah, what I mean? I get like, to wake up and love my job. I sometimes walk outside and look. I'm like, I can't believe I get to work here. Like, I know people are suffering, but we're here's a place where we have beds available to give people this amazing experience of recovery. And it's not just, you know, therapy sessions and trauma therapy and and you know, on digging up what those triggers are. We have a fitness center. We have an arts therapy building. We ha we do meditation. We bring in outside vendors to do educational seminars. There's so many things that we're doing to try and round out that experience because basically what sets Wellbridge apart is treating the mind, body, soul. They're really whole person focused. They are data driven. So we talked about the research center component, um, you know, it's going to be amazing. But right now we don't have too much external research that we're doing. It's more internal data. Um, and so is that is that how the research primarily works is that you basically know what's happening with your patients internally it's just keeping really good track of everything that's happening and then looking sort of back at the numbers finding trends in statistics Correct. yeah okay. yeah you got it nail on the head um, yeah we so we'll do an initial assessment when our patients arrive um, it's not forced sometimes people come in and they really just got to get you know mm -hmm. stabilized um, and we'll do a midway assessment and we do an ending assessment when we're preparing to discharge. And that really helps us keep that treatment path that they're going on effective. And, you know, you might be going through a trauma session and you uncover something that you really weren't aware of or didn't disclose to your therapist in the beginning. We can incorporate that by just continuing to go back reevaluate making sure we're on the right track and it's different for everybody Those, yeah yeah so and you guys find that like the you mentioned like all these activity type things mm -hmm. that you offer and that seems to me on the surface to be a really helpful thing because um as much as i guess you could you can talk about internal things going on in your mind and you can you can verbalize and have other people analyze and say words back to you I, I feel like that's, although an important component, it, 
it might not be the only thing that helps. Like you, you may actually have to find a bunch of stuff that you enjoy doing and do it yeah. a lot and sort of just have have activities that bring you joy. That's right. Um, and to, you know, something to look forward to essentially. I mean, uh, uh, that's the the hope aspect of recovery I, w- yeah. I would that I would hope to use that word again is is present because um, if you have stuff to look forward to stuff that you're excited about and passionate about it's got to just make dealing with anything you're dealing with no matter what level of of the difficulty it is that much easier yeah. you know rather than not knowing what you're looking forward to to do the next day I think you need to come work at Wilbur <laughs> <laughs> you know all the things so hope is one of the biggest words we use um, all the time but yeah it's you know we talk about the research side. So Wellbridge really is founded on evidence-based practices. So mm-hmm. there's a whole body of knowledge and, and you know studies and all these things that are known about addiction, but it's ongoing and, and it's changing. So yeah. I think an example would be how the use of alcohol um, since the pandemic has skyrocketed. I'd say 80% yeah. maybe um, is, is of the patients are coming in is, is alcohol. Mm. Um, and so that's always changing and it's kind of slow to translate sometimes to, um, treatment from, you know, your therapist or your psychiatrist. So what we do is try and be innovative at the same time. So we're using the evidence-based stuff, but we're also innovating at the same time. And we, what we do know is when you are going through addiction and you've been drinking for years and daily and you're using drugs, you know, it really reduces the the dopamine receptors in your brain. So mm. what you used to love or relationships you found to be um, impactful or valuable in your life, you lose that passion and joy mm. you used to get from them. So what we hope is that people will come to Wellbridge and, you know, use our services that are available and find these new Um, joys, passions, or rediscover things that they used to love, whether it's painting or ceramics or um, we have a golf simulator uh, on on campus, which, you know, serves twofold. You could be letting out your anger and aggression, but you're also like, wow, man, I used to really love golf. And this feels so good to get back into something that I I find joy in. Yeah. Anything that you can focus on that's enjoyable, but that also it's like no one's the best at anything. I mean, I'm just there's somebody who's the best at golf but like probably most of us are not the best at golf so there's always something to improve there's there's always something to sort of like use your mind as a tool and sharpen that tool and like when you when you get better at something and you can measure the progress that's sort of inherently very rewarding and so that that's that's maybe a, a a a way to like jumpstart your your dopamine back up. Yeah. You know what I mean? It's yep. like appreciating that you've done something better than you did it before. Yes. You know what I mean? You get a little pride out of that. You yeah. can't help but do it. And, um, you know, you just got to find the thing that you like focusing on and then measure that the mat, that improvement. Right. Um, and there's a lot of cool simulator stuff out there yes. now. Like um, I, I, I have a friend who convinced me to buy a Oculus to play virtual mini golf with him. Wow. I'm here on Long Island and he's in That's New Jersey. Cool. And then all of a sudden we're on the same like themed mini golf course. It's like Candyland or something. Yeah. And he's a floating head with a golf club and so am I. <laughs> you know what I mean? But we have a conversation kind of like we're on the phone or FaceTime. Yeah. Only I'm looking at his funny avatar. Yeah. Um, and uh, But it's loads of fun. Um, and I didn't even like golf that much. And then I started liking it more. And then I ended up buying like a little mini golf set here for the studio. That's so cool. Uh, well, if yeah. you could be in Candyland and play golf, I mean, that's it's just. It's pretty fantastical. <laughs> you can also fly in the around the mini golf course it's um, really amazing yeah one of the uh one of the backdrops had like stars and a moon and we got uh interested to see how if we could fly to the stars yeah um in the little backdrop and it, it was very weird um wow but it and it took a while and uh but we kept going until we got to the little I little star in the backdrop my son was at a play date and i went to pick him up and his friend had gotten an oculus set mm-hmm. and he was like mom you gotta try this you got and i was like I'm good. I don't know that I want to know. Like there could be like <laughs> something way better than reality because it might get a little like uh, talk about addictions. That could be true. something that we see down the road. That's very true. Um, I, I can imagine that. I I kind of have a personal tolerance for just at least with the current technology. Yeah. Of how long I want to physically feel the headset on me. Yeah. And I get uh, sort of annoyed with having a thing on my face sure. after 45 minutes tops. That's you know good what to I mean? know. That's good to know. Yeah. Uh, but. Um, it's also a way to motivate me to exercise. So I bought Beat Saber 
which is slicing at objects to the beat of music. Wow. Okay. But they make you bend like down. Kind of like Fruit yeah. Ninja, but like they make you bend down and stand up to avoid hitting objects. All physical activity. So it forces you to do physical activity. So I have to squat and lunge <laughs> and move and I end up sweating a little bit. Um, and the and reward it, is fun. The reward is fun. And it's music <laughs> and there's like a rhythmic, I have a rhythmic pride, right? Like I, uh, like I play rhythm guitar. Yeah. I can... I, I think I can hold the beat fairly well, so I want to be like really on beat with the the slices of the. It's saber. so interesting you just said that because one of the things I wanted to mention and forgot was um, we do drum circles. We have oh cool music therapy. I was going to ask you if you do music we therapy. We do. Yeah. We have a really wonderful um, instructor who he's a retired FDNY and cool. he is a, an amazing trauma therapist, but he runs our drum circles and. You know, it's funny, like pe- they'll come in and kind of be really uncertain about what they're seeing. And they're yeah. like, this is crunchy. Like, what is this? And they leave laughing, yeah. talking about it. They're so engaged. And there's something about that rhythm. Mm-hmm. Um, the way he described it, the the therapist was saying it's it's almost innate. Like it's mm-hmm. it's like a heartbeat that you heard for 10 months in like your mother's womb. And then, you know. Sure. And you get back into that, and it just really brings you back. It's grounding, and that's the word we use um, to describe why we have our setup like this. It's down regulation. Mm. You know, you spend hours. It's hard work. This is not. You know, I might have described it the wrong way. This is not some spa retreat where people are coming and laying around all day and laying by pool. It's hard work. Sure. It's, it's group after group after individual therapy session. You know, and. The point is to be able to downregulate, and you're up here all day, and then you can come back down. Right. And we do have serenity pools, but it's minimal time throughout the day. It's restricted. It's supervised. But, you know, in a structured environment, you get to really practice self-care, things that some of these folks probably haven't done in a really long time. You yeah. know, their focus has not been there on themselves. So um, in that sense. So, um, yeah, it's just a really, really great program. Yeah, I was what when you made the joke about me working at Wellbridge, I thought, <laughs> well, music therapy would be the thing that I could be, participate you, in the, the, the most in terms of what mm-hmm. I know. But um, and then, you know, if you extend music therapy to maybe uh, making music in the studio, I can definitely help out. Um, You're and, making and, my wheel spin right now about I mean, we do a lot of really intentional discharge planning and I I was wondering how you and I could make this connection afterward and okay I'm curious. We'll talk after, but yeah. I think I like the sound I mean, of that I mean, for listen, our patients. You know, creating music in real time as a performance is a beautiful thing all on its own. And then when you consider music production, you almost think of it like a like a canvas that you can add layers to over time. Yeah. So I can perform one instrument and that's the first coat of paint or whatever but then you get to come back and get add more yeah. and then you see what it grows into and you can get better at it over time you know um and so there's that that kind of joy of like i started out with an idea or nothing and, and then an idea and then now it's a whole song yeah. that like sense of accomplishment even if no one ever hears it, even yeah. if it's not a hit song, just the fact that it didn't exist and then you did stuff and now a thing exists and it's you can listen to it and you can enjoy it. And um, if if you have creative musical thoughts, you often feel like there's a thing in my head, I want to get it out. Mm-hmm. And successfully producing a song, it, the success part comes in listening to it and saying, this is what I had in my head or something close enough to it that it makes me happy that it's now out. Like, wow, look what I produced here. Yeah. If I, I put my heart to it. Yeah. Um, and so I, w- I was thinking of that. I. I experienced a drum circle once on a brief trip to San Francisco in the park. Sounds about right. Yeah. Um, It just (laughs) seemed like it was there all day and people just come and go. Um, but you got me thinking about the the tempo thing, and, and that's the, the amount of beats per minute that we mm-hmm. measure, right? So if we measure 60 seconds and then how many individual beats occur if we're counting uh, music. And it occurs to me that, like, when I'm going over in my head, what are the popular tempos in, in music? Like, different genres typically utilize somewhere between 80 and 120 beats per minute. Okay. And that's actually pretty close to like the range of human heartbeats uh, from like resting to excited. Right. You know what I mean? If you're a really good athlete, maybe it's going lower than 80. Yeah. uh, And it should. And mine doesn't because I drink too much espresso. But, uh, you know. That's a cool parallel. Yeah. Like, you know, dance music is often at 120 because that's like your heartbeat when you're exercising. Yeah. You know what I mean? And then like hip hop is like 80 beats per minute because we're like chilling and nodding our head to the beat. And then everything else is somewhere in the middle. 
pretty much. The you know what I mean? Vibrations. It's, it's a, yeah. a whole new topic of conversation that people are. If you go slower than 80 beats per minute, you're putting people to sleep because our, our sleeping heart rate really drops yeah. down low. And if you go faster than 120, you have to be really intensely yeah. dancing and excited. Yeah. But that's pretty much the range. And so, you know, you can you can make music with the intention of, of bringing a, a human heart rate t- to the state of sort of matching the tempo of yeah. the music. Yeah. And that's how you sort of synchronize with the thing that you're listening to. So this if you're drumming cool. at like, you know, 80 something and you came in like, with your heart racing, eventually your body will kind of match the beat of the room. Yeah. You know what I mean? It's it like can't assisting help the down regulation with music. Yeah, it's like giving an it's example. Really cool. Like, you know, okay, we're here now. Yeah. You know what I mean? We're not here. Yeah. That was before when you were all amped up and now we're here. Yes. And so the the drum circle come you know can bring you down and up like I that. I really cool. love that. That was that was awesome. And I again we'll have to talk afterward, but I'm you know, equipping patients when they leave typically our stay is about 30 days because Mm -hmm. we do take you know commercial insurance that's that's most that that's the most that they're usually going to cover um and of course if people need to stay longer there's that option to pay for that but that's just how insurance works these days um but when they leave we always want to make sure there's an aftercare plan because you have to have that you have to have that structure and you know, we will follow through and make sure, not make sure that they're attending, but follow through and, and seeing how it's going. Yeah. Do do you need assistance like finding something else? But it's not just therapy. We're not just sending people to outpatient centers. We want to equip them, you know, vocational skills yeah. or... Um, Stuff to do that's fun housing, and, and you helpful. Know, yeah, yeah, everybody's story is different. You may not have somewhere to go home to. So, right. but even stuff like this where um, you're replacing those gaps now with passions and joys that are healthy, yeah. healthy outlets. Things so. that are creative and productive. They can be work related or work adjacent yeah. or, you know, whatever it may be. But, mm-hmm. um, you know, I, you know, listen, I, I've been sort of infatuated with the world of music production and audio recording technology. And I've recently learned more about video, but the most of my career is just being super obsessed with making a record that sounds so good that people will listen to it for years and years. Mm-hmm. Because, you know, when I was a, a a kid and a teenager, I was I would fall in love with records and mm-hmm. I listen to them over and over again. And then you find a record that's twenty years old and it's still great. That's inspiring. That means that you know, because because like music and entertainment can often be about like now, sure. what's the top thing now? Love my um, parents' music. Yeah, yeah. I, but but when you when you create something that lasts longer and it gets, you know multiple generations can get into it. There's no way to know that when you put it out because, of course, you literally have to wait to see if it stands the test of Mm -hmm. time. But that's always been the motivation for me is creating something that is like, you know, it's like a canvas, a piece of art. You you can take your time and layer it. And when you say it's done, it's done. And now it's available to everyone. And you hope that people still care about it. Yeah, almost like a legacy. Later, yeah. Yeah. And, um, you know, that repeatableness is what drew me to, like, production and studios rather than live sound, even mm-hmm. though I love concerts, and you can record concerts, sure. which is cool, but it's, um, you know, it's it's now and then it's over, yes. and you don't get to, like, savor it again and again, yeah. and so that's why I was drawn to, you know, making recordings, because they're meant to be repeated again yeah. and again. because they're that good. That yeah, and, and reused. Yeah. You want to make it so good that it's, like, the ultimate definitive version of something, and that's... You know, it's like a, a sculpture or something. You you can it can take a while. Sometimes yeah. you see it in your head, and you're like, no, it's not quite there yet. I have to I have to do more to it. Sometimes you need another person to come around and say, stop, it's perfect. You're going crazy with it. You know, um, but ultimately you you finish at some point, and and you get to be proud of it. Um, so I've been doing that particular form of creating things and and being interested and and proud of them for a while, and it, it's good for me. Um, but there's so many different ways, you know what I mean? I mean, I'm so happy you have something you're so passionate about for Thank your, you. just like not a job for you. This it, is, yeah, basically. This is really cool. <laughs> yeah. And it's like therapy every day for you. <laughs> That's great. I think so. But yeah. you know, um, anyway, so, okay, cool. So, uh, how many years have you been, uh, with Wellbridge now? I don't know if I asked you. Well, geez, not even a year. So they opened in 2020. I just started March of this year. Okay. So eight months. Okay. So yeah. So eight. they're new in general. They're new. And you know, Startups are tough. Yeah. Staffing is tough. You know, not for reasons we need to get into right now, but things are just, you know, 
but we have made such strides in the past few months that like I can now, you know, come out here and proudly just say we're actually in line with our mission. We're we're achieving goals. We have new leadership and new directors, a new medical director that has just totally streamlined and cleaned up like you know there there's things that happen sometimes you're out there selling this pipe dream and it's not really coming to fruition back right. you know back at home and um but what i love about wellbridge is the constant innovation so they hear our you know feedback that we're hearing in the field from the patients mm-hmm. and they are always trying to improve and i i see it real time which in past jobs yes it's that's been a reason key. to leave because you're like i can't be out there right. telling false hopes yeah um but i can actually say i'm working somewhere that actually really cares and that's it's so great and i wonder if being newer makes an organization more open to rapid improvement in other words like if some organization is established and they've managed to exist for a while they may be fooled into thinking that it everything's perfect yeah and it everything is rarely perfect in any organization or institution so you know there's always room for improvement i agree but i think there's definitely more of a chance that they'll they'll stop seeking out improvements actively if things function well enough you know i fix something that's not broken right sometimes it may not be broken it just may be horribly inefficient and that's you know what i mean like from an engineering standpoint like maybe you could work make it work a lot better yeah wouldn't you want to do that um and so that's really good that when you guys sense something as a staff you can say something about it and an improvement can be made it's yeah. not like a system that's rigid right. um, because things that are too rigid often will crack right if you're flexible and you can adjust yes. to what's going on then you can bend uh, you know as needed and, and stay relevant agreed and you know actually I don't think I mentioned this but we are founded by Northwell they're one of our founding partners okay. so Andy got started by himself he spent eight years I think trying to get through red tape with the town of Riverhead to get this place even you know mm-hmm. accepted let alone built and along the way Northwell kind of heard about it and believed in his mission too and so that you know those resources were also really wonderful us to have we're not a, a Northwell uh, affiliation or hospital but if we ever needed resources, or I think it actually helped us get into some of those insurance contracts like quicker than most people would, and that's been such a blessing because okay. the help is needed now, yeah. and we have open beds, so yeah, we're there. Well, that's yeah. good to hear about Northwell. I see their name everywhere. No, I, I know. know they're like taking over they healthcare are. on Long Island, so mm-hmm. I'm glad that they're helping you guys out, even without being like yeah. directly owned or affiliated with them. That means that someone over there at Northwell has a heart for sure, and that's good. And you'd be surprised, actually. We actually help them too. We we have um, a close relationship with their EAP so okay. and we are going to be eventually starting a medical professionals track that's the next program we have where medical professionals have a specific group and program um, where they can come out and have the trauma therapy they need or you know just coping skills and mechanisms and anything that's really um, for those unique needs and I'm super excited about that yeah that sounds interesting I imagine if you if you work in medical you might be hesitant to like suddenly become a patient right Absolutely. you feel like you belong on the other side of it yeah who's gonna see me who's you know yeah will I lose my license those right. are definitely rational fears and, uh, it, and uh, for one thing it might help to just be you know, in there with others who also work in that field. Mm-hmm. So you're not immediately not alone. Mm-hmm. So that's smart. Yeah. Okay, cool. All right. Well, th- this has been really awesome. I so can't far. believe how fast time went. <laughs> I know. I feel like we could totally keep going, but I, I know, know you have a phone call that you're going to take. So yeah, thank you. And I think we did get to a lot of really good information about what makes Wellbridge different. Um, thank you. Thanks for giving me the platform to talk about it. Absolutely. It was interesting to, to learn about. And, you know, I, I like that it is here. And yeah. by the way, for everyone, it's in Calverton. I don't think we said that, but that's where it's physically yeah. located. Here and if on I could Long just Island. plug the phone number real quick, our, s- our support center is um, works right on our site. So we don't outsource anything. They're open nine to nine and we do admissions up until about 845. So it's 631-840-0762. Um, you know, we'll get to work right away verifying those benefits for you and just letting you know what that will look like if you did choose to come to Wellbridge and um, everybody's trained and prepared to um, get you through the door. So, For anyone who needs to use that number, please do not hesitate. We will put it in the uh, description and the show notes for this podcast video. We thank you, Stephanie, for coming and talking to us today. It was awesome learning about Wellbridge and, and your journey to Wellbridge and in Wellbridge. Thank you so much. You're very welcome. Thank you, everyone, for listening, and uh, we will see you next time. Hi, my name is Stephanie Morgan. I'm Director of Business Development on Long Island for Wellbridge Addiction Treatment and Research Center. We're located out in Calverton, and we are an inpatient detox and residential addiction treatment center, also treating co-occurring disorders. 
in a very dignified and respectful environment. I encourage you to check out our website, wellbridge.org. And if you have any questions or are, um, are curious about what we're doing out on our campus, you can call 631-840-0762.